I got a personal message from a Christian the other week and decided to make my response in the form of a video. This person seems to be a creationist, as opposed to a moderate or progressive Christian. I'd like to point out to this believer that there are many devout Christians who fully support the theory of evolution. People like Francis Collins and Bishop John Shelby Spong accept the findings of modern science and don't insist on a literal interpretation of the Bible. When some Christians automatically assume that atheism and evolution are one and the same thing, it makes me think of someone who believes that if you wear a hat you must live in a cold country. Why would anyone wear a hat in a hot country? It's a massive oversimplification, but that's what creationists invariably do with the all atheists are evolutionist devil worshipper type arguments. So some of what follows has very little to do with atheism and more to do with scientific literacy. The message contains what I see as errors in thinking, or fallacies. I'll explain as we go through. This started as a discussion in a comment section, but it seemed to me that the other person was sending more than receiving, and they seemed far more interested in trying to persuade me that the God of the Bible is real than trying to understand my point of view. So, this is how the message starts. Why can't it be God? Why can't what be God? This question actually fits better at the end of the message, but this is how it arrived in my inbox. I'll cover this at the end. The universe had a beginning, correct? As far as we know, yes. The Big Bang Theory predicts that space and time began at a point 13.7 billion years ago. The measurable expansion of the universe and the cosmic microwave background radiation both lead us to this conclusion. There are other lines of inquiry which also back this up, such as our understanding of galaxy formation and stellar evolution. Who created the stars and other galaxies? This question is strange because of the word who. Who implies that there must be a personified intelligent creator. It would be more logical to ask what created the stars and other galaxies. That way the answer could be either a natural process or an anthropomorphized god. By asking who, the questioner narrows down the possibilities and limits the scope of any possible answer. There had to be a time where there was nothing. No, not really. The scientific understanding of the universe is, like I said, that space and time began to exist 13.7 billion years ago, which means that there is no such thing as 13.8 billion years ago. I see it as a bit like the temperature scale. Scientists use the Kelvin scale, which, unlike Celsius and Fahrenheit, has no negative scale, so zero Kelvin is the coldest possible temperature. Absolute zero, or minus 273 degrees Celsius. Atoms cease to vibrate at zero Kelvin, which is what heat is. Jiggling atoms. As far as we know, matter, energy, space and time all began at that starting moment. There couldn't have been a time when there was nothing at least according to the current understanding of the best human minds that have been investigating this subject. Who else can bring it into existence out of nothing? Oh boy, how to try to decipher this. Presumably by saying who else, this person means who other than the God of the Bible. Well, if it has to be a who rather than a what, how about other gods? The Quran says Allah did all that even though some would argue that Yahweh and Allah are the same deity. As far as I'm aware, they're both imaginary. Or how about ancient aliens? Maybe an intelligent alien species realized that their universe was approaching its heat death and managed to figure out how to start a new one. But that still doesn't answer where the intelligent aliens came from. As for bringing the universe into existence out of nothing, we have to try and figure out what nothing is. Lawrence Krauss has written a book on this subject, which I haven't read yet, but I've seen a number of his talks, so I have some idea about how dark energy is present in the vacuum of space and acts as an accelerant for the expansion of the universe, and that particles pop in and out of existence in this vacuum.
I don't fully understand how this works, but that's what the universe seems to be like. So rather than looking for answers in holy books, which say it's okay to treat women as property, and partake in the genocide of those who happen to follow a different holy book, we can find out how the universe works by asking the universe. We can make observations, take readings and measurements, and try to figure out what's going on. The God of the Bible only seems to understand the universe as well as the people who were around at the time it was written. Before telescopes, microscopes and all the technology we take for granted today even existed. We now know that epilepsy is not possession by demons. We know that the stars will not fall out of the sky. We know that curses don't cause illness. Viruses and bacteria do that. This next one is puzzling. All the mattress energy. I'm going to assume that the person meant all matter is energy. If so, then it's not quite right. Matter is matter, and energy is energy. But they can be interchanged. This is what Einstein's most famous equation describes. This is what happens in stars like our sun. Stars are mostly made out of hydrogen, the simplest and most abundant element in the universe. When a very large amount of hydrogen gas begins to condense and attracts more and more as its gravity increases, it begins to spin and becomes more and more dense, which increases the pull of gravity and the hydrogen atoms are packed tighter and tighter so that they heat up and after a certain point nuclear fusion takes place. Hydrogen atoms fuse into helium atoms and release energy in the form of heat and light. A star is born. Depending on the size of the star, it can burn its fuel in a few thousand years for a very big one, or it can keep going for a hundred billion years or longer, in the case of red dwarfs. Our sun is an average star and will shine steadily for about ten billion years. We are about halfway through this process, which has been enough time for primitive life to evolve into complex life like you and me. This is a very simplified description, but the basic principles are there. You think the sun just happens to be in the correct place for human life by chance? Yes, but I need to qualify that. We need to see it from a different perspective. The earth is in the habitable zone of our star, which means that liquid water can exist here for long periods of time. We must also be grateful for plate tectonics, which slowly move the continents expanding the oceans and compressing the land to form mountain ranges. Plate tectonics work because the earth has molten rock beneath its crust, which means that the plates effectively float and move according to the slow convection currents. Another important detail is the molten iron core, which gives us our magnetosphere, which protects us from harmful cosmic radiation from the sun. Without this protection, we wouldn't have evolved in the first place. The size and density of the Earth is also important. It's big enough to have gravity to hold on to its atmosphere, but not too big to prevent relatively fragile plants and animals from being crushed by their own weight. With the wording of the question, I'm not sure if this person realises how small the Earth is compared to the Sun, and how far away we are. The Earth is about 8,000 miles in diameter. The Sun is over 800,000 miles in diameter. The size difference is something like the head of a match compared with a basketball. We orbit the Sun at a distance of about 93 million miles, which would be like putting our match head down at the other end of the garden or in someone else's house across the road. Compared with the Sun, the Earth is tiny and it's very far away. But this distance happens to be not so far away that all our water is ice, and not so close that it all boils away. So if there happens to be a suitable planet in the habitable zone of a long-lived star, that's where you're likely to find intelligent life. And guess what? That's where we are. Where else would you expect us to be? What about the ozone layer that protects us from radiation? Who put that there? The ozone layer consists of molecules which are made of three oxygen atoms, and this has the very useful property of preventing too much ultraviolet radiation getting to us and causing skin cancer. Why this person thinks that some one put it there, rather than it being the result of natural processes, I can only speculate. 
The idea that God poofed it into existence seems like a just-so story to me. We know that elephants didn't get their trunks by having a tug-of-war with a crocodile, but it's a fun story. Once we understand that ozone is formed by the ultraviolet radiation itself, and during lightning storms, and that it has the properties which cause it to settle in the stratosphere, then why invent a supernatural explanation? Who equipped all the animals with their defence mechanisms fit for survival? Once again I must ask, why does it need to be a who? We have to understand that evolution is a well-documented and tested natural process which explains how animals adapt and change through the generations over long periods of time to survive in specific ecological niches. The survival rate in most species other than humans is low. Infant mortality is high, and to our evolved sense of morality, the natural world can be incredibly cruel. We might not like it, but that's too bad. The survival of the fittest through natural selection ensures that only the strongest and healthiest individuals survive for long enough to reproduce. Six thousand years is nowhere near long enough for evolution to have accounted for the diversity of species we have today. But all the geological, fossil, peat bog, ice core evidence and more point to the fact that the Earth is much older than 6,000 years. Nature tells us that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old and that single-celled life existed for about 3 billion of those years before complex multicellular life began to appear about 500 million years ago. Once again this is a very brief description but the details are correct as far as we know. No supernatural deity required. Who can look into the future and have foresight and knowledge for what they need? No one can actually look into the future. Time travel is a nice idea and makes for some interesting science fiction, but there is no evidence to suggest that backward time travel is possible or that we can travel forward in time any more rapidly than one Earth day every 24 hours. We can make predictions about what the future might be like, based on our understanding of the past and present, but most predictions of that kind have been wrong or vague. We can have foresight and plan ahead, save money for a rainy day or build an extension to accommodate future offspring, but the idea of some kind of oracle or prophet is no more than an appeal to superstition, wishful thinking and delusion, in my experience. It has to be God. Who else? Why ask who else? Why not widen the perspective and ask, what else? There might be a supernatural god behind the scenes, pulling the strings and listening to us when we talk to ourselves, but I strongly doubt it. Not because that's what I want to believe, or choose to believe, as I'm often accused of, but it's because that is the way it seems to be. My brain doesn't let me ignore information which contradicts what it says in the Bible, and my sense of curiosity ensures that I find such information. I don't have the kind of faith which allows me to accept something which doesn't seem right, and there's an awful lot in the Bible which doesn't seem right. If a book says that men can live to nearly a thousand years old, chariots can fly, snakes and donkeys can talk, and a man can be invincible provided he doesn't get a haircut, and people are telling me that it's all true and that it really happened, I'm not going to say, oh, OK, that sounds plausible, where do you want me to sign? That would be dishonest and ignorant, based on what I already know about this world and how it works. I hope this is helpful to the person who sent me the message, and that it gives some insight as to why people like me don't accept religious beliefs as being an accurate description of the real world. This video has been an expression of my point of view. Please don't blindly accept what I say. I'd rather you checked it out for yourselves, and if I've made any mistakes, please point them out to me. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.